Unitarians have always had a strong interest in social responsibility, trying to help others where possible and in doing what we can to promote justice and equity and compassion in human relations. This is a manifestation of the golden rule as it's so called, the principle that of treating others as we would wish to be treated ourselves. It's, if you like, it's a unilateral moral commitment to the well-being of other people without any expectation of anything in return. It's a sentiment that occurs really very widely in one form or another. Nearly every religion and every ethical tradition has some version of this golden rule. You can find it in the writings of um, ancient Egypt, ancient China, Confucius, the Tamil, um, uh, the Sanskrit and Tamil traditions of ancient India, Persia, Rome, Greece, wherever you go in any religious tradition, there's usually some version of this uh, so-called golden rule. In our cultural heritage of Christianity, we're most familiar with the golden rule in the way that Jesus expressed it, love your neighbour as yourself. Yeah, love your neighbour as yourself, that's fine, but some questions arise. Who is my neighbour? And in what way are we supposed to love our neighbour? Well, the Christian answer to who is my neighbour is revealed in the Bible story of the Good Samaritan, which we read. Tom Wright, whose translation we used, tell, said that in order to get to the point of this story, we have to imagine ourselves as the victim. So if you imagine going down the road from Jerusalem to Jericho, we're a long way from any towns, and then there's a moment of fear and panic because you're set upon and beaten up. There's a sickening pain, and you're too weak to resist, and you're left lying in the ditch when the assailants have left you. But there is a moment of hope as footsteps are heard approaching. Surely they must have seen you, but they go by on the other side of the road. Then it happens again. More footsteps. Surely this time they'll help, but they don't. And then another. This time there's a donkey as well and a strange voice. Someone not from these parts. You're bathed with oil and wine and taken to an inn where the rescuer pays for you to stay. The victim was a Jew, and the two who passed by were Jews. But the one who helped was from Samaria. He was one of those despised Samaritans. In Jesus' time, that meant the other lot, those people who live over there. They hate us, we hate them. They're different. Keep away from them. But it was the Samaritan who proved to be the neighbour to the man who was set upon. The Samaritan, in reality, was not the enemy, people with whom we have nothing in common, people who might be our enemies, people we dislike, can be our neighbour. This was the supposed enemy who was the neighbour. So our neighbour, I think the point of this story is, it's not just a cosy circle of people like us. We need imagination and vision to see beyond this close group. There is no barrier or limit to whom we should regard as neighbour. The whole point is that everyone can potentially be our neighbour. That's why it's one of the core precepts of Unitarianism that we believe in the inherent worth and dignity of every person. Well, that seems straightforward. But a second question is, I think, how are we supposed to love our neighbour? What might be uh, a guiding principle or a sentiment to help us? What, um, what sentiment or emotional state do we need to try and arouse and nurture to help us love our neighbour? Well, one commonly prescribed feeling is empathy. And in some ways, uh, uh, I'm going to hook on to a discussion we had after the service last week um, over coffee 
uh, there was discussion about whether we should help beggars in the street uh, and so on. And Tony McNeil uh, used the word empathy on uh, a couple of occasions. Uh, and I want to focus on empathy because um, there has been a lot of interest in it in recent years. There are several books on it now, a number of books, and uh, former President Barack Obama is frequently quoted as saying, the biggest deficit that we have right now in our society is an empathy deficit. Well, empathy is sometimes said to be valuable and indispensable uh, in guiding us in our behaviour to others, so I'd like to explore it a, a little bit. What we're talking about, uh, when we talk of empathy of course, is the ability to understand and share the feelings of another person. The ability to share their feelings or experiences by feeling what it would be like to be in that person's situation. It's when we experience emotions that directly match another person's emotions. When we think what another person is thinking or feeling. So the differences between oneself and the other become really indistinct. Well, empathy sounds like a pretty good starting point for loving our neighbour. And interestingly, I think, we seem to have an innate capacity for empathy. We seem to have a built-in capacity, if you like, to empathise. There's a recent book by Paul Bloom, who's a, uh, a psychologist from Yale University, uh, and he gives um, an account of some work by neuroscientists who spotted something uh, really quite remarkable. They found that when a macaque monkey performs an action like reaching for a raisin, certain neurons fire in the brain. You know, particular neurons, but these neurons are the, the nerve cells which have trillions of connections with other nerve cells. But what is interesting, they found that when the monkey sees another monkey performing the same action, the same neurons fire in its own brain. These are mirror neurons. Well, maybe these mirror neurons provide some insight into how human empathy works. If I see somebody walking along and accidentally smack their head into an iron bar, I, I flinch. I don't know whether you've had, ever had an experience like that, but you see somebody crack their head open and you involuntary reflex I can flinch. It's because the neuroscientists say the same neurons are firing in our brain as what's happening there. It's a, an involuntary thing. But it seems to suggest that there's a some kind of biological explanation for instinctive fellow feeling. Oh, so far so good. If empathy does have a biological basis uh, and it does seem to be built into our makeup, that's great. But I think we need to be a bit careful. If we think of emotional empathy, where we, we think about the world as we believe somebody else does, if I say, I feel your pain, this emotional empathy might not be the best guide for loving our neighbour. Paul Bloom, this Yale psychologist, even says it can be dangerous. For one thing, it operates in what he calls a spotlight fashion. It feels the pain of one person we can see, but ignores anyone who's outside the spotlight. The fact is, we can only realistically empathise with a small number of people. Joseph Stalin famously said, well, it's a quotation, rightly or wrongly, that's usually attributed to him, but Joseph Stalin said, when one man dies, it's a tragedy. But when a million die, it's a statistic we can really get to grips with a single death. It means something real and personal. A man or woman dies. The person is dead. But how can we possibly take in the enormity of a million deaths? So I think there's a bit of a paradox here, or at least what seems to be a paradox. How is it 
that it's easier to empathise with one person's suffering than with that of thousands. We can more readily empathise with the suffering of a starving little ten-year-old girl called Katrina than we can with the whole population of the Sudan. Or we can more easily, more readily empathise with Sheila, a 43-year-old from woman from Gateshead who has been beaten up by her partner than we can with all victims of domestic violence. You may remember um, quite a few years ago, actually in 2010, the world was really gripped by the news of 33 Chilean miners, there were miners in Chile, who were trapped underground for 67 days, you, you may recall this. But every night, the TV news brought us pictures and bulletins of the latest twists and turns in the story. But interestingly, if you look at with the World Health Organization statistics on worldwide road deaths and traffic accidents, around a hundred times as many people are killed in traffic accidents every day. Yet these deaths go unreported. The Chilean miners were easy to empathise with. We knew their names, we knew the names of their partners or their wives, we knew their backstories. We don't empathise with the thousands of people killed in road accidents. There's actually about a million and a quarter people killed <coughs> their wives and roads. It's just a statistic. So, I guess what I'm saying is, empathy is innumerate. It favours the one over the many. So isn't it a bit perverse when the suffering of one can matter more than the suffering of a thousand? It seems irrational. Another difficulty with empathy is that it has a, a moral bias. We're more likely to feel empathy for people like ourselves. I think in the discussion uh, over coffee last week I think David made reference to Newcastle supporters um, Newcastle supporters are more likely to feel empathy with other Newcastle supporters than with fans of Sunderland white people are more likely to feel empathy to feel more empathy for other white people the brain areas that correspond to the experience of empathy are very sensitive to whether someone is someone we like, whether they think they're personally attractive, whether they're a friend or whether they're both. Now, whether it's acceptable or indeed whether it's desirable to favour some people over others does raise, I think, some quite difficult philosophical and ethical questions. If everybody is our neighbour, can it be right to be a bit picky and a bit choosy based on our personal preferences? There's, I think, a conflict here. I don't think anybody is saying that we should try to create a world without empathy. Certainly not. We certainly shouldn't give up on empathy. But it might not be the best guide to, in moral decision making, um, given its innumeracy, irrationality, um, its moral bias, and so on. So, how do we deal with that? Well, one thing is to use reason as well as sentiment. We should use the head as well as the heart. Now, the head and the heart are very, very loose terms, but I'll use them as a piece of shorthand. If we want to put our resources and our energies to the best use, where they will do most good, empathy might sometimes nudge us into irrational behaviour. Empathy doesn't do numbers. <coughs> An unthinking reliance on empathy is part of the reason why people's desire to help abused dogs or a penguin drenched in oil exceeds their interest very often in the suffering of millions of people uh, in other countries or maybe ethnic minorities in our own country. Our charity is not driven by rational assessment of what can do most good we should use evidence and reason to dictate how best to allocate charitable donations. We should, as the Americans say, we should crunch the numbers. 
we should consider the facts about how our £20 can be put to the best use and not necessarily be swayed by charitable leaflets which have a cover showing a photo of some adorable doe-eyed child. Using the head and not just the heart, we need a little bit more reason and maybe a little bit less feeling. Or consider child beggars that you get in some countries. The sight of a child begging is shocking and it's very hard for a good person to resist helping out. And yet, the very act of doing so may end up supporting criminal organisations which enslave thousands of children and put them out on the streets. By giving, you make the world worse. Actions that appear to help individuals in the short term can have terrible consequences in the longer term. I think in the discussion, Ben and others were making the point that in some areas we see people begging who are seemingly homeless or whatever, but we know that some of them, frankly, are complete charlatans. It's pretty difficult. Now, nobody's saying the heart doesn't matter. Of course there's a place for sentiment, but perhaps there's, perhaps there's a better sentiment than empathy. <coughs> Compassion is preferable to empathy. Compassion is where we care about others but we don't necessarily share their suffering. It's what the Buddhists call loving kindness. Doctors and nurses require compassion rather than feeling the pain of their patients. That would simply interfere with their ability to make rational decisions. Good parenting requires compassion rather than empathy. If we care too much about the short-term mood of our children, if we felt their pain every time they cried or had a tantrum or whatever it was when they denied something, then we'd not be able to impose discipline which is in their long-term interests. So perhaps a way forward is to choose, to choose a middle path between the two approaches of the head and the heart. We need sentiment and reason. Daniel Kahneman wrote a book uh, which made a very big impact a, a year or two ago. Some of you may know it. Um, it's called Thinking Fast and Slow. You may have come across this book. But it contends that there are really two systems in the brain. One is fast and emotional, the heart if you like. The other is more slow and cognitive and rational, the head. The fast system serves us pretty well especially when we don't have time to think and we just want to get on with something. If someone in the street has a collecting can for the Royal National Lifeboat Institution, we have probably put something in without much thought. We don't engage in rational calculations about whether my pound could yield greater benefit if it were used elsewhere. We just get on with it. Or if we've got an elderly neighbour who needs to get to hospital as soon as possible, we don't want to start asking if it would be for the greater good of humankind if I used my time elsewhere. But occasionally, the heart, emotional empathy, can lead us into errors, like dealing with the one and ignoring the millions, which the slower system of using the head can be useful in correcting. In loving our neighbour, it would be very surprising if we have no place for empathy. But as David Edmonds of the Oxford uh, University Centre for Practical Ethics said, he says, empathy on automatic pilot is morally unreliable. What is needed is a co-pilot, reason. The use of reason is very appealing to humanitarians. In loving our neighbours ourselves, we need the head as well as the heart.